Hi, this is Andrew Marty from SACS. The topic for today is resilience, particularly resilience in tough times. We're going to be looking at what the world of research tells us about what makes people resilient, but also how to increase resilience, both in ourselves and in employees who might report to us. So we're going to start the presentation with some objective setting. And objective number one is a definition. Psychology, like many sciences, is all about what is resilience? What is the definition for this characteristic? So then we're going to talk about why does it matter? We're going to talk about the benefits of resilience to organizations and individuals. And we're going to talk about personal characteristics which drive resilience, such as IQ, personality, and values. Some of these characteristics are largely genetically determined and some of them are acquired in the course of life, but it's worthwhile talking about how these things come about because that gives you an opportunity to identify resilient people before you actually hire them. But I guess that many people are watching this video purely and simply because they want to understand how to build resilience and we're going to lead you through contemporary resilience building techniques. So firstly, the definition. So resilience is a term commonly used in relation to positive psychology. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what positive psychology is in just a moment. And positive mental health. In other words, when people are resilient, they tend to be less likely to succumb to mental health problems. The most common of these mental health problems are, of course, anxiety and depression, but there's a range of them that people can experience. And here's a real psychological definition, the general capacity for flexible and resourceful adaptation to external and internal stressors. Now that might not seem all that explanatory, but in fact, there's a lot of meaning here. Firstly, it's talking about the, a general capacity. So resilience is not something that's targeted, say only to work problems or only to home problems. It's a general capacity to cope. Flexible, people can adjust to a range of different circumstances by having resourceful approaches to adapt to these external and internal stressors. So what is an external stressor? Well, economic downturn, illness, those sorts of things are external stressors. Internal stressors are things like our emotions. They might be our experience of illness. If we are ill, they might be things like fatigue and that this quote is from Clonan in 1996. But people who are truly resilient are able to undertake a phenomenon called post-traumatic growth. Now, just to explain what post-traumatic growth is, and I'm sure you've all heard of post-traumatic stress, but post-traumatic growth, growth is a phenomenon where people actually grow from bad experiences. And truly resilient people have this capacity to get better after having been through trauma. So some examples of post-traumatic growth, a mother, has a child who becomes very ill. Subsequently, she may discover that her relationship with that child is enhanced, but maybe her relationship with her entire family and her friends and work is enhanced. So trauma doesn't always have to result in a downgrading well-being. And so post-traumatic growth, we know that even in very major catastrophes, some people grow from those. And the people who grow from them, we, we know from the research, that quite often somewhere between 20 and 40% of people actually report having been improved by the traumatic experience. What do we mean by improved? Well, I mean, happier, less anxious, less stressed, better relationship with other people, maybe more productive at work, those kinds of things. So post-traumatic growth is a phenomenon that's getting more and more research at the moment. And we also hear of this thing called crafting, crafting or bricolage, the French call it, couture from France, um, often has written in the past about bricolage. Bricolage means kind of making do with what you've got at hand. So truly resilient people, when things go wrong, don't always seek help to get uh, you know, new equipment, new solutions, all that other stuff. A, a truly resilient person is able to stand on their own two feet and get things done. Even truly resilient people, of course, will ask for help when it's necessary but they have that resilience to be able to deal with things. And some people who are truly resilient may end up being gritty, which is sort of the hard edge of resilience. You see people talking about grit all the time, which is persisting against, object, against odds to achieve some meaningful objective. So to get to the real heart of the matter, one of the things that we know about resilience is that focus plays an enormous role in resilience. That is to say, that, and this is a quote, 
the secret of life is what you focus on. Now it's a quote from me actually, so uh, I hope that doesn't sound arrogant, but uh, yeah, the secret of life is what you focus on. And the reason I wrote that was because it dawned on me that if you look at people's psychological well-being and if you look at their success in life, so much of it comes down to what they focus on. So if you focus on things that are helpful to you, then you are much more likely to be psychologically well than if you focus on things that are harmful to you. So for instance, people who are highly resilient focus on things that are actually going to make them psychologically better. Optimism and positivity. Now, you all know the glass half empty versus the glass half full, but it's true. And the caption there about diary research, I'll just explain briefly what I mean there. Um, on a number of occasions, diary research has been undertaken on this topic. And so what you do is you can get a group of, let's say, 500 people and you split them in half and you try to match the halves where uh, same ages in the both halves, same gender balance, same life experience, same levels of education, this kind of thing. You would have two matched samples and you ask one of this, these samples of 250 people to keep a diary where they write down all of the challenges that they had day by day. And the other 250, you get them to write down all of the good things that happened to them in the course of their day. And they do that day by day. When this has happened, what you find is that the people who keep the optimism diary, the blessings diary, if you want to call it that way, end up significantly improving their well-being, whereas the people who keep the challenges diary often end up with declines in their well-being. Why? Because of what they focused on. And if you focus on something for a long period of time, you actually change your brain. It's a thing called nervous system plasticity. You will make the neural pathways of positivity and optimism stronger by focusing on good things rather than focusing on bad things. This goes also for conversations at work. If you have a lot of negative conversations at work, then your well-being will decline, not may decline, it will decline. And it seems that negativity is more contagious than positivity. Some research indicates that one negative is worth three positive. So what that means is that if I say something pessimistic and negative to you, I actually have to say at least three positive things to get you back to where you were before I opened my mouth. So this stuff is contagious. A focus on solutions rather than emotions. Now, humanistic psychology for many years said it's really important to sit around and tell each other how we feel. Well, sadly, there's quite a bit of evidence that if you do that, particularly if the feelings expressed are negative feelings like anger or depression or fear, then what that does is it actually practices anger, fear and depression, and we become more angry, fearful and depressed. Whereas if something goes wrong and we sit down and work out a good solution, what that does is that it sponsors a thing called optimism and it sponsors a thing called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the psychological characteristic of believing that we can cope. People who have high self-efficacy are self-believers. They think, oh, well, I'll get through this. Whatever the challenge is, I'll get through it. So a focus on solutions is better than a focus on emotions. Doesn't mean that you can't ever talk about emotions, but once people have had a chance to get it off their chest, then what we really need to do is to redirect them to solutions as quickly as possible. Let's fix this. A focus on the future. One of the things that we know is that resilience is helped by a future focus. Now, what do we mean by a future focus? I've often worked with organizations that are going through very significant changes and the employees will say, well, we know what's going to happen in the future. We might have a head office in Darwin, New York, Sydney. We don't know. I and mean, this is say if the organization is going through restructure. And what I say to them is that you don't have to focus on the future six months down the track. A focus on the future in terms of what we're looking forward to in the coming week or the coming day or what we intend to do in the coming week or the coming day. A focus on the future is better for you than a focus on the past. Really important point. Now I'm going to talk to you about a thing called locus of control. Locus of control is a, a concept that's been around in psychology for a long time. It's really saying, where does a person perceive co control to be? So if this is a person, this is a person with an internal locus of control. They believe that they have an influence on their life. They believe that they can make things happen in their life. They believe that they can avoid negatives in their life. That's an internal locus of control. This is a person with an external locus of control. So I just want you to reflect for a moment that if you think you can affect 
what's going on in your life versus you think you can't, what do you reckon that would do to your psychological state? Well, you're probably right. Psychologically, it's better to have an internal locus of control than an external locus of control. People who have significant external loci of control often suffer from a thing called learned helplessness, which is really quite a traumatic experience. It's this belief that I can't do anything in my life and that I will continue to be prey to whatever the winds blow me. Now, if we look at this arrow, what we're really saying is that many resilience building techniques are all about taking an external locus of control and making it an internal locus of control, rather, uh, sorry, often purely and simply by what you focus on. And so we'll talk further about this down the track. Now, does this stuff matter? Well, yes, it does. So resilient employees tend to be psychologically healthier, tend to be better at problem solving, they're calmer, they tend to follow their own problem solving initiatives, which means that they don't wait for somebody else to solve their problems. They're good at coping. They tend to have healthy personality profiles. They tend to cope well in social situations, tend to be more thoughtful, more planning orientated, and they possess an internal locus of control, as we've already mentioned. So where does resilience come from? Uh, well, like most things in life, it comes from a combination of nature and nurture. And uh, Francis Galton, when he invented this term in the late 1800s, nephew of Charles Darwin, by the way, which is why he was kind of interested in genetics, uh, nature, nurture. What you find is that some of these characteristics, such as cognitive ability, largely genetically determined. The estimates are between 70 and 80% genetically determined, as suggested by twin studies. Personality, largely genetically determined. You will get arguments about exactly what percentage comes from our genes, but it would appear to be between 50 and 75%, let's say. I believe that the truth is probably about 70%. Doesn't matter that much. Most psychologists would agree that the majority of personality is not learned in life, it's in the genes. And certainly one of the things that we know from longitudinal studies is that your personality at age three, the big chunky bits of your personality, like I like people or I'm shy, I'm a risk taker or I'm cautious, those elements of personality seem to settle at about three years of age. Um, and then there's nurture. And so if you want to increase your resilience, well, it's good to be born with the right genes, but also there are things that you can do to increase your resilience, skills that you can build, experience factors, trying things and finding out how they help you. And also your values, your attitudes, your styles can affect your resilience. And I'll go on to explain exactly how. So let's talk at the nature bit first. So one of the things that we know is that people who are highly resilient tend to experience more positive emotions than the people who are not so. And we know that people's positive emotions vary enormously from day to day. So good things happen, I'm happy. Bad things happen, I'm a bit sad. Good things happen, I'm happy again, and so forth. But one of the things that we know is that for most people, longitudinal studies of well-being show us that most people kind of their peaks and troughs are around what you might call a set line. And some people's set lines are higher than other people's set lines. So this set line here, okay, that's the figure for one person. Another person's set line might be here. And so even though they will also have their ups and downs, the level of well-being that they feel on a day-to-day -day basis um, is around the set line. So the set line appears to be somewhere around two-thirds genetic. So there's a very strong genetic component in all of this. Now, Sonia Lubomirsky, who is a positive psychologist, and um, just to explain what we mean by positive psychology, psychology historically has been a rather gloomy business. And uh, the famous Sigmund Freud, what he was really concerned with was things like obsessions, phobias, neurological issues where people felt that they were paralyzed, those kinds of things. And back in those days, psychology took the perspective of what might be called the medical model. So the medical model perspective is that well-being is an absence of illness. Now, personally, I think that's a horribly gloomy perspective on life, that as soon as you don't have a disease, you're gonna say you've got high well-being. Positive psychology takes the view that taking people from minus 30 and getting them back to zero is not enough. Positive psychology believes that it's possible and it's with the right evidence, it's even efficacious uh, to take people from 
zero and to get them to plus 10 and then plus 20 and then plus 30. So positive psychology is the psychology of human thriving. And so we're going to talk about how we can do this. Now, Luba Mirsky, she believes that the genetics of happiness is only 50%. Yeah, well, we can argue about that. I mean, I'd say 70, but it doesn't really matter. She believes that the things that happen to you, the good and bad experiences in your life, that accounts for only about 10% of your level of happiness. She says the stuff that you make happen, the things that you plan to do, so that goes back to the skills, the attitudes, those kinds of things, that will determine about 40% of your levels of well-being. So that says that you can really improve your resilience, you can improve your well-being by doing certain things. And so we'll get to what those things are down the track. All right, I want to talk a little bit about the neurology of the human brain. This is a photo of a project or a result of, from a project which was called the human connectome. And the idea of the human connectome is that what they were seeking to do is to identify the main neural pathways in the brain. So you see these really dense bits. That's where a lot of neural pathways exist. And you see some of these are radial and some of them go around and so all the neural pathways. A simplification, and every neurologist says this is a simplification because I've had them say, to, say it to me, uh, is to say that the brain has two functions. A new brain function, which is the outer part of the brain. Why? Because it evolved most recently. That's what makes it new. And then there's an inner part of the brain, which you would call the old brain. And you'll notice that there's a kind of a distinction, a neurological sort of gateway, not a gateway, but a, a separation, if you want to put it that way, between the new brain and the old brain. Now this is important because one of the things that we know about the human brain is that it doesn't tend to speed up or slow down in the way that other, other parts of the body do. If you look at how much oxygen and glucose that the brain consumes, which are the sort of two foods of choice of the human brain, uh, seems to vary very little in percentage terms in the course of a day, whether you're fast asleep or wide awake. And so what all of that means is that the body can't, if you turn on one part of the brain, the, the brain can't draw more energy from the body. So if you turn on the new brain, and in particular, if you turn on the prefrontal cortex here, which is all about thinking, planning, reflecting, doing all that cognitive stuff. And in fact, if you're listening to me now, you must have this bit turned on or you wouldn't understand me. When you turn that bit on, it tends to drain energy away from the old parts of the brain. Now, the old parts of the brain are important because they run our digestive system and when we walk, we're using the old brain. It's largely unconscious and it is somewhat conservative and fearful. It's this part of the brain evolved to protect the organism. Now, if you turn on the old brain, you also drain energy away from the new brain, which is why we get phenomena such as road rage. Because when somebody gets cut off when they're under pressure, you know, somebody's in a hurry to get somewhere and they're feeling stressed and somebody cuts them off, then you'll get a turning on of two things. One is the uh, amygdala, which is the fight and flight response center. And you also get a turning on of the hypothalamus, which will trigger the fight and flight response. And the fight and flight response will fight, flight and freeze more accurately. The fight, fight flight and freeze response will tend to change our body. Uh, but when a person has their amygdala, amygdala and their hypothalamus turned on flat out, what that also does is it drains energy from the new brain. So that literally means that the prefrontal cortex, which is your only capacity to see the future, is now turned off and your emotions are back with the cave person. And the cave person emotions are typically fight, flight, freeze emotions, which are anger, fear and depression, anger for fight, fear for flight, and depression for freeze. So does that explain road rage? It certainly gives an important clue as to why somebody who undertakes a road rage activity looks back and thinks, who was that who did that thing? And they're often very remorseful. Now, personality has an impact on resilience. If you are lucky, you will be born emotionally stable. This is heavily genetically determined. It means that you have the ability to regulate responses to emotional events. I mean, you know, you have colleagues who are emotionally stable and you have colleagues who are emotionally unstable. 
So emotional instability has been called in the past neuroticism or emotionality, but we know that it's negatively related to resilience. People who are high in emotionality are less resilient than people who are low in resilience. So, uh, sorry, low in emotionality. So one of the things that we know is that if people, if you work in a workforce with lots of emotionally unstable people, then that's stressful. And in fact, there is evidence that people get sick more often when they're in that kind of workforce because of the stress that's around them. Of course, also, one of the things that you get going back to the human brain is that when you're in fight and flight mode, one of the other things that happens is that the human immune system gets suppressed. Why? Because if you're in a fight and flight situation, which evolve for short term threats, what we expect is that that threat would be over quickly. But right now I recorded this webinar in amongst the COVID-19 crisis, which at the current juncture has been going for about nine weeks or something here in Australia. And you know, maybe longer than that even, but uh, you know, but that's causing fight, flight, freeze responses to people. And yes, they're not beating each other up. They're in effect sublimating it. They're managing it in a more socially acceptable fashion. But in fight and flight mode, if you happen to be emotionally unstable and you're experiencing this thing for a long period of time, your immune system will be suppressed and you will get sick more often. When I lectured at university, we found that the clinic tended to be full at exam times with true illnesses, you know, things like strep throat and those kinds of things. Why? Because the human body was suppressing the immune system in order to deal with a threat, a, a threat that it had evolved to deal with in a fight and flight fashion. But of course, that doesn't work so well anymore because of the fact that these threats tend to last longer. Emotionally stable people tend to use what a thing that Campbell Sills called task-focused coping. Task-focused coping is where you decide to fix things. Emotion-focused coping is where people focus on their emotions. I am angry, I am depressed. Now, task-focused coping, which is often called these days solution-focused coping, is all about, well, what's the point of complaining about the fact that this is bad? Let's do something about it. And we do know that organizations and teams that do something about things have higher levels of well-being than those who don't. So emotionality has a big impact on resilience, but so does conscientiousness. So conscientiousness means greater impulse control, more organized, harder working, more diligent. And certainly Fayombo in his research in 2010 found a very strong relationship between conscientiousness and resilience. And he also found that unhealthy personality profiles led to lower levels of resilience. And then finally, extroversion. Now, I am an introvert, so I really don't want to say extroverts are better. And in fact, they are not in many ways better than introverts. But one of the things I will have to grudgingly confess or accept is that they tend to be a little more resilient. Extroverts are on balance a little bit more optimistic than introverts, and some of them are way more optimistic than introverts. But as well as that, if you've ever heard the expression, a problem shared is a problem halved, extroverts are good at sharing problems. And in fact, us introverts are quite often resentful of that when we hear all of the life story being unloaded on us. But in any event, uh, extroversion, there is no doubt extroverts tend to be a little more resilient than introverts. Um, so social support helps with that. So if you look at the personality characteristics that drive resilience, uh, these two are the keys. Emotionality, so we want low emotionality to be highly resilient. Conscientiousness, we want high conscientiousness. And you notice that there's an asterisk against a thing called prudence. By the way, this is a thing called the Hexaco model of personality, otherwise known as the six factor model of personality, discovered first by Kibium Lear and Mike Ashton from Canada, amazing research by the way. So um, people who are prudent and sort of self, what that means, self-managing, non-impulsive, that's a great combination for resilience, low emotionality, high conscientiousness. The third component is extroversion, but you'll notice that there's an asterisk beside liveliness. That means being optimistic, because we know that optimistic and cheerful people are intrinsically more resilient than people who are gloomy and pessimistic. And if an introvert has high liveliness, well, they're much more likely to be resilient than a gloomy, pessimistic, negative introvert. But 
yes, I must confess that uh, low liveliness is more common amongst introverts. And the other stuff, all this social stuff, is all about the fact that they're drawing strength from the people that they know. So there is such thing as a resilient personality. Cognitive ability. That's an interesting question. Are smarter people more resilient? Are smarter people less resilient? And so here's a typical psychology result. High IQ can enhance resilience and high IQ can reduce resilience. What's the moderating factor? The main moderating factor are those two personality characteristics I mentioned earlier, emotionality and conscientiousness. So if you happen to be highly emotional and low in conscientiousness, having a high IQ is no guarantee of resilience. In fact, it can be worse under those circumstances. Why? People with high IQs who are emotionally unstable kind of almost have a genius for fretting. They can dream up all kinds of catastrophes which may or may not happen. And in any event, what it means is that they're likely to be less resilient. If on the other hand, the person is conscientious and emotionally stable, high IQ will increase resilience because IQ is an excellent predictor of work performance. So you can imagine somebody at work who's coping comfortably with their work is going to be more resilient than somebody who's sort of battling to get through it and really struggling. So those are some of the things that are nature-based drivers of resilience. Let's talk about nurture now. Values. If people are in tough times, it is a very good time to be clear about and strong on the values of the organization. It's reassuring that people feel that they're in an organization which stands for something, is ethical, in clear, is clear in what it stands for. And we do know that if you happen to match the values of your organization, many organizations test the values of prospective hires through us. If you have people who match the values of the organization, that makes for higher resilience. So if I'm a very principled, I'm a very philanthropic kind of a person and I'm working for an organization that's like that, well, I'm gonna be more resilient. If I'm on the other hand, very ambitious, driven, commercially ambitious, and I'm working in an organization which is welfare orientated, then it's likely that I'm going to be less resilient because I don't match. So here's where this research comes from. Shalom Schwartz is one of the world's most important researchers on the topic of values. And so for instance, benevolence, if, if I'm highly benevolent and I'm working in an organization that's highly achievement oriented, ambitious, driven, get goals, well, I'm unlikely to have the same level of resilience as if I'm working in an organization that's high on benevolence, just to use one value. There are 10 personal values that seem to affect people in their life and work. Now you can recruit for resilience. So SACS offers this simple instrument which measures resilience on the way in. And you see the good news is that this individual here has a high score on resilience, 62. So average is 50, this is a thing called the T-score. This person's just over a standard deviation above population average in comparison with other people in the professional world. So this individual, she is highly resilient. So one of the things that we like to do when we did big studies on resilience, and SACS has undertaken a number of big studies on resilience now, one of the things that we like to do is we like to show you some population findings. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see, for instance, are there industries where people are more resilient? And in fact, if you look at these, construction is significantly lower, property significantly higher. So for some reason, the people working in the construction sector we measured thousands of people to do this. People in the construction sector were significantly lower in resilience, whereas people in property and business services, so business services being a wide range of services that are business to business type services. And these middle ones were not statistically significantly different at all. But why property and business services? I mean, it must draw people who are for some reason independent, can cope well with stress and uh, construction, yeah, I'm not sure why. I mean, dollars maybe, I don't know. It's an interesting one as to why construction is uh, relatively lower in resilience. How about income? Does income have an effect on resilience or, or are people who are paid higher or lower more resilient? And in fact, what we see here is that from zero dollars to about 150,000, for practical purposes, that's no difference at all. But once you get up beyond 150,000, you see these two are statistically significantly higher. 
So what are organizations paying for when they pay high salaries? Um, I think they're paying for resilience, partially. I mean, they're paying for a bunch of other stuff as well, but they are paying for resilience. So what is that saying? Are the dollars making people more resilient? Well, I would say almost certainly no, because if the dollars were paying for resilience, you'd see an upward slope here, but you're not. You're really seeing it only in this cohort. I think what's happening is that people who are highly resilient manage to get to higher levels of seniority. Now, I know what people always say at this juncture of me making a point like this. They're saying, oh, well, look, I know a chief executive who's hopeless and, and uh, not resilient at all. Yeah, I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about at a population level. You get a thousand chief executives. What this is showing you is that they are much more likely to be resilient than a, a thousand people who are paid 50 to $80,000. So it does seem that people who are at the upper ranks of organizations are resilient. And I suspect the main reason for that is that they had to survive a lot to get there. Resilience versus age. Now you see there is a slight upward curve here, but it's not statistically significant, this difference. So um, the, uh, the lower sample size and high variation of the extremes, and what that means is that these groups here had relatively low samples. So we didn't have that many people who are over 65. We didn't have that many people who are under 24. Um, and if you look at this group here, they're pretty similar. So even though there appears to be a slope, and this was a sample of, I think, two and a half thousand or something. So um, in general, that's the sort of sample that would get you a statistically significant difference. And we didn't really find that. I think if you had a million people in this sample, you would have a statistically significant difference. And who knows if there is a difference here, maybe it's to do with accumulation of experience and life skills. As people go on, they become more resilient. But, okay, this is interesting. One of the things that we know is that resilience seems to be declining in the Western world amongst young people. Why is that? So there have been a number of theories. Uh, by the way, just to explain what Gillespie researched there is that he found a bunch of samples of uh, resilience, valid resilience measures, and he looked at them over time. And what he discovered is that they are declining. I have had this self-report from many of my clients there where they've had young people doing tough jobs and they found that the capacity of young people to do certain tough jobs has actually reduced over the last, say, 20 years, uh, gradually, but appreciably to the point where there are certain jobs that used to be done by, let's say, 20, 25 year olds, and they just don't ask them to do that, those jobs anymore. So one of the theories is cosseting. What we mean by that is that if there's no doubt about it, all you have to do is read novels from the 50s and 60s, and kids were kind of expected to stand on their own feet more. So here's a real truth about resilient, the resilience. You do not make people more resilient by protecting them. What you do if you protect them is you teach them that the world is a dangerous place and you teach them that they are not able to cope with the world. So if somebody has, uh, well, let's say the child comes home from school and has left their books at school, there are two ways you can cope with that. One is you can say, okay, get in the car and we'll go back and get them for you. The other is to say, well, next time you better bring your books. And they'll say, okay, well, hang on, I needed this for uh, my homework tonight. So the parent who is committed against cosseting might say, well, look, you know, you've got to bring your books home and uh, if you really need them, you're just going to have to go back and get them yourself. So, you know, I'm not proposing one approach or the other. What I'm saying is that there was a time where approach number two, go back and get your books, um, that would have been done more often. Uh, so cosseting, we know, reduces resilience. The other thing is screens. And when I, I'm going to talk a little bit about mindfulness in just a second. But if people are immersed in screens, in other words, they're spending a lot of time immersed in a fantasy world of screens, one of the things that we know that that does is that it is the opposite of the psychological phenomenon called mindfulness. Mindfulness is where one practices being in the here and now. And if you're immersed in the screens, you are not immersed in the here and now. And we know that people who are lacking mindfulness tend to be more anxious, tend to be more depressed. So there's certainly a, a rising group of theorists who believe that immersion in screens, and not just for young people either, but the more immersed in screens you are, 
the more likely it is that you're going to be anxious and depressed. It's not good for you, if you want to put it that way. So those are theories. Now, one of the things that we don't know is which of these is having the greatest impact or to what a degree it can be overcome. But we certainly do know that resilience is declining. That, that research is gold-plated. So I want to talk briefly about resilience and a thing called engagement. So what do I mean by engagement? Engagement is the degree to which a work group has positive emotions. So typically a work group with positive emotions and high levels of resilience has three characteristics. One is that they are energetic. In other words, they bring a sense of energy to their work. This is way beyond what used to be called job satisfaction. Job satisfaction is a passive thing. Yeah, yeah I like this. Engagement is a much more active thing. Thing number one is energy. I am energetic at work. Thing number two is I'm committed to my work. I think it's important. I'm going to try hard. I'm going to try to improve myself. And thing number three is I'm kind of engrossed in my work. Time flies when I'm at my work. And two theorists by the name of Bakker and Demaruti, in 2012, I think it was, wrote a very famous article unifying the science world's perspective on engagement or unifying as much as it ever is possible to do such a thing and these three factors they call them big, bigger dedication and absorption um, can be shown to be resilience uh, sorry to be engagement and why those three things largely because if you measure those three things big, bigger dedication and absorption or energy commitment and flow as we call them in our own measurement instrument at, here at SACS one of the things that we know is that when people are high in that, you get much better levels of internal outcomes such as staff retention. And you also get profit growth, you get revenue growth, you get things like higher levels of customer satisfaction, which is important. So engagement is a group phenomenon. Resilience is an individual phenomenon. But one of the things that we know is that if you can increase a work group's levels of engagement, you end up with individual resilience from those people. There is a very strong link. And in this study by Simons and Boitenbach uh, in 2013, they found a correlation of 0.8 between engagement at the group level and resilience at an individual level. So here's what work engagement looks like. I said vigor, dedication and uh, absorption. Um, and so one of the things that we know is that engaged employees tend to job craft. They focus on outcomes, they build resources, cooperation, support, they redesign their jobs to do them better, they manage and proactively acquire the resources necessary, they collaborate, and they can actually increase their job demands. In other words, they set initiatives, they want to do better stuff, they want to set themselves higher standards. That all sounds like resilience, doesn't it? So it could be said that resilience is engagement at the individual level and engagement is resilience at the group level. The two terms, I think, are almost interchangeable. They're so similar. So how do you make people more engaged? Well, I think one of the things that we have to understand is that there are, firstly, I'd say you've got to recruit people. If you recruit people who are high in resilience and have the positive characteristics from a personality and an IQ point of view that you need, you're going a long way to have an engaged workforce before you've done any leadership. As I like to say, you have two levers about the corporate culture that you have in your organization. One is the quality of people that you let through the front door. Two is how you lead them once they're in. There are four drivers for people's levels of engagement. One is the job that they do. Two is the team that they belong to. Three is the leader that they report to. And we know that 80% of their engagement, their well-being, is driven by these three things. Um, Proximal means close to me, distal means things that are further away from me. The organization for most employees is a concept and that's only 20% of my well-being. So if I work in a wonderful team in a horrible organization, I'm in heaven. If I work in a bad team in a wonderful organization, I'm in hell. That is crucial. One of the things that we know is that people's levels of well-being vary as they go from team to team, even when they're doing the one job. So I'm a member of I don't know, a project team, hey, that's really great. I'm a member of a leadership team, that's no good. I'm a member of my regular work group. Yeah, that's somewhere between the two. Your levels of well-being will vary and therefore your levels of resilience will vary from group to group. 
So let's talk about methods of building resilience, because if you can build resilience at the individual level, you'll also help to build engagement at the organizational level. Building engagement at the organizational level is a different topic, and that's for a different presentation. But what I want to do is to show you some positive psychology activities. These can be done at an individual level and at a group level. Number one, reducing focus on the past and concentrating on the future, making plans about how to get there. That is a fantastic team-based activity. You get a group of people together and you say, all right, well, what do we want to be? Where do we want to be? You know, how, what's an optimum version of us in six months time? And then let's make plans about how to get there. I suggest you do this on the basis of voting. This is what's known as a facilitative leadership exercise. It can be very, very powerful. So reducing focus on the past and concentrating on the future. Now, going back to my diagram about the human brain, that connectome diagram, reducing focus on the past also reduces the primacy of the old brain emotions like anger, fear, and depression. Concentrating on the future, on the other hand, turns on the new brain and makes it more likely that you're going to end up with emotions such as collaboration, affiliation, goodwill. This is one that was developed by Martin Seligman. Actually, I don't know whether he dreamed it up, but he certainly experimented with it. Uh, gratitude exercises, such as three blessings. The idea of the three blessings is before you go to sleep tonight, write down three good things that happened to you in the course of today. But before you go to bed, remind yourself that you're going to do the same exercise tomorrow. Then you will wake up tomorrow, pull out the spreadsheet, if you put it in a spreadsheet or the piece of paper or the Google Doc or whatever it was, remind yourself about the blessings that you had yesterday and remind yourself that you're going to do the same thing again tonight. Do that every day. Now, that doesn't take long, does it? I mean, what, five minutes, 10 minutes, I suppose, if you're really slow. But one of the things that we know is that some people with depression improve as much as a combination of drugs and counseling when they have undertaken this exercise. Gratitude is good for us. And the more we practice it, the more we build neural pathways of gratitude. And in effect, it's really the glass half full exercise. And we already demonstrated that that can be powerful for building resilience. Another thing that you might do is learned optimism exercises such as three anticipation. So let's say that you're doing your blessings every day once a week, once a month, once a fortnight, something like that, you might sit down and write down things that you're looking forward to in your life. And I suggest that this is a great thing to do in team meetings. So you undertake a team meeting and we tend very often in team meetings to focus on what's going wrong or what has gone wrong. I think it can be really valuable during a team meeting to say, all right, well, hang on, before we get into what's gone wrong, let's look back on the past week and tell each other something good that happened. Give this a try. If you do this with a team, you can markedly improve people's well-being by doing so. Gratitude exercises work. Learned optimism exercises, well, why not finish the meeting by saying, all right, let's talk about some things that we're looking forward to in the coming week. The more you share this kind of stuff, the higher the levels of well-being in the group, but also doing this makes people more resilient because they will learn this as a technique and apply it to themselves. Acts of generosity. Now, I suppose really um, the gratitude exercise, the learned optimism exercise, the reducing focus on the past and making plans about how to get to an optimum future. Well, they're clearly focus activities, aren't they? Acts of generosity, I think, is a self-efficacy activity. You could call this a locus of control activity. So I am depressed and I, in response to my depression, am going to be kind to other people. This is done a lot in psychology, associate clinical psychology. Acts, random acts of generosity can be very powerful for people suffering from depression. Why? I think one of the reasons is that I am reinforcing to myself that I have agency in my life. I'm reinforcing to myself that I have agency. I'm reinforcing that I can have some impact on things. Victims cannot be generous by definition. I'm proving to myself I'm not a victim because I can do something generous to other people. Human beings have evolved to need to live in group settings. It's a thing called convivence, C-O-N-V-I-V-A-N-C-E. -E. Convivence is the need to live with other people. So we need to be generous. Yes, human beings are selfish because we've got an old brain and a new brain. And the old brain is selfish. It will want only what it wants. But the new brain 
is generous. It will want to do things for other people. So we need to give that part of our brain free reign and the opportunity to act. Signature strength exercises. This is another Martin Seligman idea. Signature strength exercises are where you sit down and you identify the things that you are really good at. Now, why signature strength? Well, your signature is unique. And the idea is your strengths are unique. The things that you are good at are, are not the things that I'm good at. Signature strengths are strengths that are me alone. So if I sit down and work out my own signature strengths, and let me just direct you to Martin Seligman's website, uh, S-E-L-I-G-M-A-N, and his website is called Authentic Happiness. That website has questionnaires for a signature strength. So you can sit down, fill out a questionnaire, and find out about your signature strengths, it will generate a report for you. It's free if you're interested in exploring this. But once you understand what your signature strengths are, people who do this exercise increase their levels of resilience. But what increases levels of resilience even more is when you use these signature strengths in your life or in your work. So imagine doing this as a team activity. I've done this where you get a group of, let's say 20 people, you split them into groups of say four, and uh, what you do is you ask them to say, all right, as a, a, a group, as a work unit of our, this 20 people that we've got, what are we really good at? And you get them to write it down. You get them to write it down on a flip chart and you stick it on a wall. And then, by the way, you can do this with uh, Zoom polls if you want to do this remotely. Uh, but what you have is that when you've got all of these strengths written on the wall, you get people to vote for the ones that they think are truest. And that can, in effect, constrain construct a, uh, a signature strength statement for a group of employees, a very useful piece of intellectual property. And then what you do is you say, well, okay, these are our strengths. How are we going to use them more on a day-to-day -day basis? This will tend to increase the levels of resilience and by definition, the levels of engagement of the workforce, particularly if it gets enacted. Mindfulness activities, including meditation. Now, I don't want to... I don't, I wouldn't mind, but I can't, by virtue of a webinar, give you too much on this. Just to describe briefly mindfulness and what it is, because I think there's a bit of misconception about mindfulness. Mindfulness is really being in the moment. And so to describe mindfulness in a quantitative sense, imagine that you have 100 units of energy available to you to do with any task. That's the capacity of your mind. The mindfulness theory suggests that we don't bring 100 units of energy to most of the things that we do because what we have is that some of the units of energy are stolen by a thing called a narrative, which is a story about what's going on in our lives. So if I am public speaking and I'm nervous about public speaking, I stand up and of course to give the best speech I can, I should be totally in the moment. I should be thinking about what I'm saying. I should be conscious of when to slow down. When people say things very slowly, it sounds like they have something very important to say. And there are times when I should speed up because I'm trying to make a statement which is more emotional. I should modulate my voice, all those things. They take mindfulness, right? Being in the human here and now. But when a lot of people stand up to make a speech, what they're thinking is, I don't really know what I wanna say. I'm not that good at this. I don't really think these people are looking very impressed. Are they actually listening to me? And um, if you've never recorded a webinar, by the way, that's something if you're used to public speaking, you've got to get used to because, well, you know, you're sort of used to seeing in people's eyes whether they're interested in you. And uh, in a webinar, you just have to push on irrespective of what's going on. So the idea used to be that you should suppress this voice. You should suppress this voice that's saying you're not really good at this, that people aren't listening. Now, one of the neurological findings that has been really clear over the past 20 years is that if you try to suppress anything in your brain, you make it stronger. The brain does not like being suppressed. So instead of trying to suppress the narrative, what you should do is practice being in the here and now. And so instead of losing 30% of your brain space to the narrative. If you focus on the here and now, you don't shrink the narrative. What you do is you grow the here and now capacity. And that's why meditation has been used. And so a guy by the name of John Kabat-Zinn, K-A-B-A-T, new word Z-I-N-N, uh, has plenty of YouTube Googles, where, sorry, YouTube Googles, 
YouTube uh, films where you can see his technique. The reason I said Google's, Google is because it, there's a really great video of him teaching Google how to meditate, how to undertake mindfulness activities. So meditation is one of the things that you can um, use and we've all heard of Headspace and Calm and all of these apps. I'm going to give you a simple technique which is often used in the early childhood sector. It's called 54321. And you might like to do this exercise now. So what I'm going to ask you to do is firstly, just look around the room and identify five things. You don't need to name them. Now, as you start to do this, one of the things that you'll find is that if you are a type A personality, which means a, an achiever, and even if you're not, you'll start to say, well, am I, am I doing this right? Please reassure yourself there's no wrong way of doing this. What we also want to do is that thoughts will come. There is no way of avoiding this. You don't fight the thoughts. You observe the thoughts and you let them drift away. So people often use metaphors like just think of the thoughts as clouds and let them drift off across the sky. I was a couple of years ago in a Buddhist monastery in central China and their theory was that you should see your thoughts as, as sand and you drop the sand on the beach and it disappears. That's what happens with sand. When you drop it on the beach, it just becomes invisible, right? So different techniques. Some people say consider the thoughts to be traffic. Anyway, so the first exercise of five, four, three, two, one, you're going to see five things. Now I want you to close your eyes. And the four means I want you to feel four things. So it could be the pressure of the floor on your feet. It could be the temperature. It could be the pressure of the seat on your body. You'll feel four things. Then I want you to, still with your eyes closed, hear three things. Use your ears to soak up, notice three different noises in the room. Then I want you to exercise your sense of smell. Still with your eyes closed, can you smell two different things? And finally, taste. What's the taste in your mouth at the moment? Now, if you've done this activity, you can open your eyes when you want. But one of the things that we know is that that's a quick activity. It's a simple activity. You can take as long as you want in doing that. It works. It's a classic mindfulness activity. It's a little bit of a shortcut activity, but yes, it tends to make people calmer. I hope you feel calm. And uh, if you're into this sort of terminology, you might be even feeling centered, which is the expression. Um, and of course, a classic positive psychology activity to build resilience is form collaborative work groups to work together to create an ideal future. Ideal future sounds kind of like uh, curing cancer or something like that. But what we mean is that get a group of people together, deal with an issue and fix it and work together to deal with an issue to fix it. That's what's called facilitative leadership. Particularly if the boss doesn't make the decisions, facilitates the staff to make their own decisions through some sort of a voting process or something like that. So these are all positive psychology activities which can increase resilience. When I run these activities in the past, people have got in touch with me later and said, actually, I feel more resilient, I feel calmer. And give some of these a try, they may well work for you. So summary and conclusions, resilience matters. It has an individual trait component, which means things like personality, values, IQ. It has a developmental component. Local characteristics such as job, team leader characteristics are a driver of engagement, which is a driver of res resilience. Look out for my presentation on engagement where we go into much more detail about what job, team, leader characteristics and organization characteristics improve resilience, well-being at a group level. There are activities which can build grit and resilience. Now, some resolutions. So I'm gonna leave you now, but what I'm gonna encourage you to do is to spend some time thinking back over the material that you've seen and consider how you're gonna apply this. 
So a good worthwhile thing to do is to reflect on what the material is, but then to write down, let's say up to three resolutions about how to use this in the workplace. Thanks very much for listening today and may the rest of your day be full of resilience and well-being.